Welcome to Kung Fu Conversations with our first interview, Miss Rosa May. Rosa, welcome this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm in Prague, Czech Republic, mm-hmm. and it's the afternoon. And thank you for having me. We're honored. So, yeah. Rosa, would you give us your Kryptonian Kung Fu origin story and tell okay. us how did you find martial arts? And yeah, just just give us your story. Where did you find it? And dance too. Did you find one before the yeah. other? Because I, kn- uh, I well, know. Well, actually, you- I, I was a dancer before I was a martial artist. Um, and then and then it completely like shifted much more to martial arts than dance. But I, I do both now still. But um, I was in uh, dance school at the University of Michigan. I was getting my MFA in dance. Um, and so, you know, it was lots of ballet and, uh, gram technique and I was already like contortionist flexible. Uh, and so I needed to do something that, you know, was, I, I wanted to get out of just a rigid, uh, vocabulary. And so I thought, well, I'm already flexible, so I don't need to do yoga. So maybe I'll go do some martial arts. So then I started Aikido and I went to a dojo there. Um, and so, uh, I did that. And then one of my friends in Michigan was also, um, that, that I met in Aikido party. He, he was doing Kali Salat. Um, he had studied with, uh, Bert Richardson and Danny Asanto. He's from LA. And so, um, I would get together with him and we would spar, uh, doing Kali. Like I'd go after him with a, with a foam stick and be so happy if, if I got him, you know, he'd be like, yeah, good. That's, that's a great one, you know? And then with the Aikido, um, I just started doing that. Um, you know, the, the dojo, uh, was, filled with a bunch of guys who would train there like six hours a day. I mean, there, there were like diehard dojo rats there, you know, and it wasn't a famous, re- it wasn't a really famous dojo or anything like in the grand scheme of things, but people were so, so dedicated to training. And then later on, I went into uh, more, I could, when I moved to New York um, in the, in the nineties, uh, I decided I wanted to do uh, Kung Fu because I love the forms, you know? And also I felt weird because like I had done Aikido already for three years and I didn't know how to throw a punch. And then I'm like, well, you know, I can't be doing a martial art and not know how to throw a punch. That would be ridiculous, you know, because Aikido is a lot of throwing. And um, I mean, yeah, there are some strikes that initiate an attack, but there's not like really, really, you know, study of how do you throw a good punch or or things like that. And so uh, then uh, I went to Lama Kung Fu uh, in New York, uh, and that was with Chan Tai San and Steve Venture and Inichenzi were there. And uh, it was like on 18th Street uh, uh, crossing Broadway. Um, and so it was great because I would go there in the afternoons and train, and then I'd stay there until like 11 at night. And <laughs> they were just like, yeah, stay the whole day if you want. You know, um, and they were really great. And because they saw I was like really, really flexible, I didn't just do the Lama Kung Fu, which is Tibetan style of um, uh, of Kung Fu. Uh, it's a Southern style and it's very similar to like Choi Le Fat. It has elements of Bak Me as well inside. And so, um, you know, one of my friends who actually brought me into the system, he said, Lama Kung Fu is so beautiful because it's like it's like, you know, a monkey fighting a crane. And I was like, sold. That that's awesome. And he was an animator and and uh, he's gone on to animate for um, Disney and, and Marvel and Pixar. And, you know, he he explained Kung Fu through animation. He's like, look at the trajectory of the movement, you know, and it was so beautiful. He talked about like C curves and swooshes. And and so so I really love that. And then after I did that for three years, you know, um, I, I just thought that maybe I, I started doing competitive wushu because my teacher uh, at the time, Steve Ventura, used to also do modern. And he said, you know, your body would be really good for modern wushu. So then he would teach me modern wushu in the afternoons and then I do traditional. And then I was still doing the Aikido, too, because I love all martial arts. Um, and and then uh, and then I, I, I tried out and I, I was on the U.S. wushu team uh, for a while. I, I, I did lots of competitions. And later on, I switched to Mantis, uh, and it was um, a pray, um, seven star praying Mantis, and also eight step. There was also Mei Hua Mantis in there with uh, Master Su Chang in in New York, because I thought the Northern South. I, I wanted to keep on with traditional while I was doing modern, uh, and uh, I loved the Mantis. I loved that when he was going in there, he had very structured way of teaching because I looked at 
Shaolin schools in New York too. Um, but I thought it was too similar to modern wushu and I wanted something different. So I really um, went into the mantis and, and I was always training with master Sue. And I also met my uh, future partner there, Mike Martello, who's really well known in the mantis community. And, um, you know, we just, we just kept on, we would, we would train all the time with my training brothers in New York. We would, uh, after I finished dance rehearsal at like, nine they would like knock on the <laughs> actually the studio didn't have a doorbell so they'd throw a rock into the window <laughs> and then and then <laughs> we just stay at the studio until like one in the morning and then go eat in chinatown um and it was really really great like i love my training brothers in new york and then i also uh trained with uh master uh Chen Ying, uh, Sifu Chen, we called him. And he was a great, great, um, wushu teacher for modern wushu. So I did, I did the <laughs> traditional mantis then and modern wushu with Sif, uh, Sifu Chen. Um, he was with the Fujian wushu team. And then later on, I, uh, I kept on with the Aikido as well. And then when I moved to Belgium, uh, I, I, I kept up with everything, you know, doing more of that. I started coaching the Belgian, uh, wushu team. Um, I was still doing the mantis, but you know, at that point I had learned, am I talking too much? <laughs> no, go. No, okay. <laughs> no you're great. Here, here, here's, okay. the, here's the great part about this Rosa is <laughs> you get to do all the heavy lifting and Owen and I just get to be like, yeah, Kung Fu. Great. Awesome. Okay. And then, okay. And then we'll, so- and then we'll ask you more. Maybe at the end of the story. Now, this is great. Okay, because I can just go on and on. So um, the thing is, you can go on. Okay, so when when I um, (laughs) when I when we moved to Belgium, because Mike he was my training partner, and so we would do all these competitions in the U.S. together. Um, He Mike was really interesting. He he did uh, one wall handball. He was national champion in one wall handball. He was also national champion in in mantis. He studied. uh gymnastics and also uh Wing Chun with Teddy Wong and so he was like so great at all this oh and he also did competitive gymnastics when he was young and I do think that a lot of the great like martial artists that I've seen in my humble opinion weren't even you know informed so much from just like pure martial arts training I think a lot of the great martial artists that I've met in my life um have hybrid origins like Mike's Mike's secret formula honestly to his martial arts and why his kung fu was different from everybody's was because he was a one wall handball champion that's a real new york thing they do it in coney island you know and he understood the arm swings like he moved like a monkey you know because the ball doesn't lie you know if if you're not fast you're just gonna well you're gonna lose or it's gonna smack you in the face or, or anything and so um he got he he understood that feedback loop from um the the one wall handball and so his kung fu was very very different you know and later on uh i had another kung fu partner one of my best kung fu partners um kim hawkland who uh he, his background was taekwondo wu tang um mantis kung fu um and karate uh but he was competitive skateboarder you know and so all his movements were so xie tiao in Chi- in chinese Xie Tiao Xing is like so coordinated. Everything comes together as one. And so, you know, I, I, I really appreciate that. Like people who have, uh, you know, backgrounds and there's a particular sauce to making their kung fu look so knit together, you know? Um, and so that was that when, um, when Mike and I moved to, uh, Belgium, he started doing workshops all around the world and he started hosting a camp, uh, in Beijing with, um, some very, very famous teachers. Uh, one, uh, a Tongbei master named Zhang Xingbing, who is my, my Tongbei master now. And then also, uh, he, he also, uh, trained with Wang Jie, who is a great, like, mantis and tai chi master in Taiwan. Uh, Mike and I would go to Taiwan and train with Wang Jie. He's great. Um, and then, uh, he would also bring in other peoples like, uh, Sun Lao for Bagua and Yu Lao who is, uh, who, who coached the Beijing Swai Jiao team. So really it was the full gamut of, of, of a range of martial arts. So it wasn't just like Kung Fu. It was also, uh, it wasn't just forms. It was also Swai Jiao. It was Chi Na. It was Tai Chi. It was, it was everything, you know? Um, and, uh, so, you know, we were just always involved in, in, in all this Kung Fu stuff. Um, Mike died of a, a heart attack in, in, in 2009. 
And so, you know, before he did, though, he he said, because, you know, I had gotten to a point of my martial arts training because I'd been doing it for 20 years about that time, you know, and I'd done like over 10 years of competitive wushu and kung fu and had been pretty successful at that. Got my black belt in Aikido, yada, yada. Um, but, you know, what he said is, you know, to complete your trajectory, you really need to you need you need to train Tong Bei with Zhang Laosi. And I was like, oh, God, another style, another because, you know, I had done hundreds of forms, both weapons and empty hand. And I loved it all. But I was getting to a point in my martial arts training where I really felt like I had plateaued. Like I I felt I'd kind of seen everything. I could just learn another form. I could watch a video and just teach myself a form. Um, and there wasn't really any exploration. I didn't have like a vertical trajectory of my learning anymore. But when I started training with Zhang Laosi in Tongbei, and I first started training with him in 2008, and I saw that, and they were just training in a black park. Like, it was dark in Beijing. And, uh, you know, it was cold. It was like the middle of winter. And they would always train at night. And then there was a street light there, too. And they would always stand in the dark. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Why, why don't we go train in the light? And he's like, mm. 我不需要什么电灯,我能听得到, which means, you know, I don't need a light. I can hear it. I can hear if your kung fu is correct, you know, because they would be doing stuff like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and he could hear your hits and your strikes and the heaviness of, of your blows. And also you're using the vocalization of the heng ha jing, which is very, very specific to Tong Bei. And I was like, well, that's, that's strange. <laughs> I was so, I thought it was so weird. And I was like, so you guys don't want to stand in the light? And then, and then he goes, Oh, no, no, no. Also, if you stand in the darkness, your eyes become stronger and you can see, you can, you can see objects in the dark. And also I don't need to, to see, to hear. I can hear your Kung Fu and understand, uh, how good your attacks are. And that was something that just blew my mind at, at the point, at that point, you know? Um, and, and then I kept on, training uh Tongbei after Mike died, uh Zhang Lasu would come to Europe to do seminars. I would go to Beijing, uh, you know, and and train with him and also his disciples. And honestly, I'd never seen anything like it because there's really nothing like the Tongbei, you know, it was so different from everything that I had trained before. Um he he did two styles of Tongbei, both Bai Yuan, which is white ape style, and also Wu Xing. Um, which is five elements. He started that later. Um, and he was already incredible with the Bai Yuan, but when he started the Wuxing Tongbei, that was just a game changer. Um, and, and everything that he was teaching in terms of a lot of the, the concepts seemed almost counterintuitive. Like he would say, Oh, uh, Han Yol, Han you know, like he would look at my forums and say, Oh, so much. So much power, so so powerful. But actually, he was insulting me. <laughs> like no, he was he wasn't saying it. It was like I knew how to perform martial arts. You know how to do it for an audience, how to do it for competition. You know how to look fierce, how to how to do acrobatic stuff. But I didn't understand the applications. You know, and 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 that was the big thing. Tongbei and that is force generation too. That that yeah. meat and potatoes. If yeah, you will, like of, he, of the he, yeah, yeah. He really emphasized everything had a function, you know. Like, like, are, are, what is your target? What are you ha- aiming for? Here's how you drag a log across the the ground, and then you whip your hips into it in order to sort of heave it over. But it's very much li- linked to if you think that like martial arts, a lot of it comes from agrarian culture. You know, they were the, like, you know, um, some of my students is like, oh, I learned the tombay, and then you know. I, I was able to chop wood so well <laughs> because you use pizang. And it's like, if you really want to improve your Kung Fu, go out into the fields and go thwack some weeds with your sword or, you know, go cut firewood. You know, it fixes everything. Yeah. I, I was, I was raised in the Rocky mountains. And so yeah, my too. dad and I, yeah, so Owen and I are both mountain kids. And uh, nice. I, I grew up with a wood stove and my dad and I, we were selective cut loggers, so we weren't clearing down the forest. But a BLM guy, Bureau of Land Management, would go and he's like, I want this tree taken out, this tree taken out, this tree taken out. And then on the side, we would sell firewood. So we drag out all the dead trees. And for the first four years of that, 
I was the wood splitter. So my, my nice. country origin story is, is the ax, if you will. So when I got into Pichuan and we started doing the splitting, I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Put an ax. You're like, I got like, this. I got this. <laughs> I got this. I got this. This so is my I, wheelhouse. <laughs> that's, that's it. My friend, mountain kids, mountain kids, Kung Fu. So I've got a couple questions for you, Miss Rosa. If we, sure. and, and, and I, I still want you to, if there's more of the origin story, you can keep going, but. What do you feel? Do you know the origin story of Wuxing Tongbei? What is the background of? And and it can be mixed. You can give us what you like, but you know, um, do, do you oh, know there's a, you know what I, I mean with the with the origin story. It's so so long. Um, I I would rather that like I mean a lot of the movement is based on the the moves of a of a white gibbon. Okay? okay. So it has origins into the monkey style. Um, in terms of, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it more from, in terms of what differentiates the style from other styles of Kung Fu and other styles of martial cool. arts, I feel. Cool. Um, and that, that is great. that the Wuxing Tongbei really focuses on like 50, 50 stance, right? Um, so, uh, that's really different because most Kung Fu styles and also most styles of fighting, you have more of a 60, 40 or, or 70, 30 stance. You know, the Wuxing is very, very particular. It uses a down, up, down, up, down, up um, to really harness the energy. So even the punches, even the punches, because normally when you do a punch, you're going to go into a 70, 30 stance. Most people do a gong bu, right? So you go from ma bu. And then when you do a punch, you go into gong bu, 70, 30 stance. Or when you retreat, you might do a ba, ba ma bu, which is the, the half force stance. So you're going into like 60, 40 with uh, 60% of your weight in the back leg, 40 in the front, right? Um, but the Wuxing really, even in the strikes, it stays in the 50-50 stance because you're, you're drilling your, your, uh, heel into the ground and you're using the ground to propel yourself up and you're torquing your, your body. So with the hips, you're really going into your internal rotation, you know, and you twist and, if I were to describe the the arm movement, um, it's not really because people are like, oh, you do piqua. Oh, you do. Uh, and it's, it's it's very different than the the maja uh, tombe. The, the masha tombe is very different because that's all, that's a hybrid style. Um, the, the closest thing I could say is that uh, wuxing tombe is very much like uh, if you had a ball and a chain. And you're basically training your basics to think that the, that your hands are the ball of the chain. And then, and then, and then your arms are like, you know, the, the chain. And so if you think about it, you really have to swing in order to get that ball over, you know? And I remember when Zhang Lao uh, started training more of the Wuxing Tongbei, he would just like boom into my arms and it felt like a cannon had, had, had landed there because he started relaxing and this relaxed ball and chain idea of really swinging your arms forward, um, was such a game changer for me. I was like, what is that? You know, because before I would say, you know, one of the most profound martial arts I'd seen was like in, in, in Taiwan when I met Wang Lao uh, Wang Jie, uh, and he was doing, uh, both Tang Lang, uh, Mantis and also, uh, Tai Chi. Okay, and so the principles of Tai Chi are such that he really didn't focus so much on the forms. He was very focused on push hands and ting ting ji, ji uh, ting li ting li ting li is listening energy. So it's like he would be like, "Yes, imagine that your hand is this mosquito, so I should not be able to feel you any more than I would feel a mosquito." And he was so precise and circular, like nothing could be broken. Everything had to be connected, and so. Like when he would touch me, I would feel like, wow, it's like vanishing into a black hole. And his chin na, his like arm, uh, the, the wrist immobilizations were so, so painful, you know? Um, and I thought that is incredible. But, you know, the thing about the tombe, it's almost diametrically opposed to tai, tai Chi because Tai Chi relies on this, uh, ting li, ting li meaning the, the listening energy because so you have to touch the person sense where they're going, feel where they're going, and then redirect their energy, right? Um, Tombe has a little bit of a, a, it's almost like if you were a Tasmanian devil, you don't really give uh, about, you know, what the other person is doing. <laughs> I mean, you do, but many of the traditional approaches 
to uh, training, for example, in any martial art, is that if this person if, if this person does X, I'm going to do Y. This person does C, I'm going to do D. You know, um, if if you do uh, a jab cross, here here are three responses. And tone based philosophy is a little bit different. Actually, it's very different from that. It's like I don't care if you do a jab cross. I don't I don't care because you're going to go in for for this sort of like ball uh ball and chain swinging thing. So regardless of if they're on the right foot and hitting you with a with 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 you know a, a jab or a cross or it doesn't matter which hand is forward or whatever uh you're going at them with the ball and chain so if you are in the way of the ball and chain it's going to get stuck it's going to get stuck into into your vortex you know of the swinging chain you know and so that's very very different um in terms of the fighting styles uh the way that you have uh you know the 50 50 stance and really using the ground instead of instead of a jab cross uppercut hook you have you have uh for example you'll have a p you'll have a dansa which is a brushing hand for deflection uh you have pi which is like palm strikes zong chuan middle strikes uh and then you have a chuan so chuan so oh my god which is the circular hand i've gotten hate massive hate from the mma community because at first they would say oh that that guy's got look at that it just looks like a wild chicken because you do throw your arm out but you don't swing it out to the side. You actually turn your hips. The arm goes for like a hook, what would be the equivalent of a hook punch. And then it smacks the guy, but they don't see it because it should aim straight out and then go down. So um, so people who saw like some twenso of Tongbe on TikTok, uh, they'd be like, oh, it's the KSI technique, you know, uh, because there's a boxer who, who's really loose. And so that you see almost these swinging, flailing arms. And so that's, that's what they, you know, related it to. Um, and, and, and for me, personally, when, when I look at other styles, probably, um, the closest thing is Irish bare knuckle boxing. Honestly, because, uh, you know, there was a guy in New York named, what was it? Carl Cesari. I loved watching all of his videos. Everybody on YouTube, just look it up because, He's a great, I love his voice. I love his fighting theories, you know, um, because a, a lot of it is, it, 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 I would say that the Irish bare knuckle boxing that, that, that he was teaching, it almost looked like a primitive form of, of, of the Wuxing Tongbei. Really, it was like, it didn't have like all this long, quote unquote, elegant swings or whatever. Um, but, but a lot of the fighting theory was very, very similar. How would you contrast like the two different styles of Tongbei that you know? Like, okay, in terms so of, you know body method and maybe application. Yes. Okay, so the Baiyuan system, uh, which is the white white ape style, that um, and and that was uh, Zhang Lao who learned that from a very famous Baiyuan teacher in 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 Beijing named uh, Zhang Guizhang, uh, who passed away now. Um, his Wuxing teacher is Zhang Fusan, who is still alive now. Um, he's he's like eighty. Uh, so the Baiyuan has, is more forms, you know, um, it doesn't have necessarily that 50, 50 stance. Um, it, it, it has a lot more high and, and low positions. It does have forms. It has like, um, you know, like a 24 or cannon fist. Uh, it ha- it has, um, a 48 cannon form as well. Uh, and they also, they do a lot of the, the, the target training. Um, but the, what you, what you'll see is that, you know, the, the whooshing has much more like this emphasis on the down, up, down, up, down, up. That, that the whole idea is like a dunk, dunk, the dunk, the dunk, you know, um, what I, what I explain that when I'm trying to teach it to my students is it's like a tram. I call it the tram. Of course, like in the States, you don't have lots of trams. They have lots of trams in Europe, but it's like when you are, you're on a bus and it just suddenly jolts to a stop. And then you, you, you have to like sink to sort of ground yourself and your body suddenly pops down. I said, it's very much like that. It's not like a plie, like when, when people do like the slow bending, um, and, and, or they go down too low. It's not really a low down either. It's really much like you go hm, 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 and you catch yourself. So it's almost, it's really like being on like public transportation and it jolts to a stop and you catch your body. 
Um, and that's very, very much like the whooshing principle. Whereas, um, the Bayern, because, you know, it's white Gibbon style, it emphasizes like the long, loose swinging arms a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you might have like, I think the Bayern system has a lot more, uh, you know, uh, like the snake footwork and the monkey footwork, uh, that you see, uh, that, that has probably more of a direct tie to mantis kung fu. Um, you know, because they always say, uh, Tongbei is, uh, is Tang Lang Chen de Mu Chen. So that means that Tongbei is the mother style of mantis. And you see it, you see it in the styles. Um, but the difference is that whereas mantis focuses a lot on, say, like forearm movement, you know, and, and really like, uh, they would say mantis, but I love, I love mantis, but I, I, I do, I do think that I've learned so many, so many forms. And I would say that many people did not know how to use 90% of the techniques they were doing in the forms. And this is sad. I mean, who wants to learn Kung Fu for like 10, 20 years? And then when you look at a form, you have to think about it before you know what you're doing in the air. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's a little, then you're doing it for aesthetic purposes. Then it becomes something very esoteric, you know? And so what the Tongbei taught me was like, you know, don't just use your forearms. You because tombe actually means through the back. Tombe means, you know, you have to use translation. Use your whole body. The whole body is, you know, is powering the movement. And the arms, for example, you don't you don't have the idea that the arms just come up. The arms never come up on their own. It's like you they're velcro. So when you even do something like this, it's like they're Velcro to your body. And so in order for you to create a whip-like motion, you imagine your arms being Velcro to the to your body. And at the last moment, boom, it's like a slingshot, you know? And so this this whole idea of, of creating, um, you know, a training methods so that you can use your arms like a slingshot, it's very, very particular to the Tongbei. And what I also like, they have a couple of, theories that I love, 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 um, that I never found in other styles of Kung Fu. Um, and maybe other people have it or not. Um, the, uh, there was the idea that you use the Hung Ha Jing. They use the vocalization in the trainings. And a lot of times in other martial arts styles, they would say, oh, yeah, you don't, because they use the broad term of Fa Jing, you know, to basically um, to expel energy. <laughs> They, they have that some, you know, like in, in certain Southern styles, they do that. In almost all Northern styles, nobody makes noise, right? Um, in, in Wushu, except for Southern practitioners, they don't really make noise. Uh, they, they, they use the vocalization to really harness the chi. And I teach that actually from my students, uh, to my students on day one, you know, cause, uh, in other styles are like, no, 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 you don't learn fudging until after 10 years of training. Um, and I teach it from day one because it's very, very hard. You, I, I even do a test. It's like, do hmm, hmm, now try and do hmm, and step and punch at a different time. It's very diff. It's very difficult. And basically, it comes down to this: it's coordinating the stepping with the striking, step and strike, step and strike, and then hips weapon, hips weapon, hips weapon. Move the hips before you move your weapon. You know, um, like 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 these concepts that seem so so primary. They get lost, you know, the, the, and, and another big thing, you know, that gets really lost is like, what are people using their martial arts for? Like, if you're learning 10 forms, pick any form that anyone is learning. And what I did is I, I started a different way of teaching my students. I was like, I'm not going to teach them forms anymore. I'm going to teach them on a target. I'm going to teach them every strike, every weapon stuff on a tree. And then they're going to show me the form. Show me what it looks like. So to all the mantis practitioners out there, show me, show me Lipi. Teach Lipi to your students on a tree. Don't show them the form. Uh, uh, teach it to them on a punchy, on a heavy boxing bag, and then have them show you the form. You know, because what you'll realize is that there are many movements in there that have been so stylized or annotated or uh, added onto or embellished that uh, the, the applications are lost. And the students don't know it. And the thing is, is that when you see a student perform the form, it's evident. It's very evident because you'll have these strikes that go da 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 da, boom, boom, and the rhythm is off. And you can tell that they've never actually used that series of five punches on anything. 
you know? Um, and so I, I, I'm a huge advocate of, of, of target training now. Everybody go out and teach every form that you teach your students on a target and then have the students show you the form. How about that? I love it. Is that some of the biofeedback? Because we had discussed a little bit over Instagram on this thing. Is is that some of the biofeedback loop that you're talking about? Yeah, you talk- yeah. Okay. Could could you elaborate just a little bit more on that, Rosa? Sure. Sure. Um, basically, I am obsessed with this notion now of proprioceptive feedback loop. So what does that mean? Uh, let's just go to, to, to like feedback loops, right? When anyone is learning a musical instrument, let's say drumming, right? You hit, you hit the drums. How do you know, how do you know if it's good? Well, if it sounds like shit, then it is, you know, I mean, if it sounds good, yeah, you know, maybe Sheila E is going to hire you or something. Right. Um, but you, you, you get feedback. Oh, this is good. Oh, I, I don't understand the snare. Oh, my rhythm is all really like, it's really messy. I better take it down to like 60 BPM rather than playing at 120. And I'm going to clean up this, this riff, you know? And so they practice and they practice and they practice and they get that feedback loop. But what if someone had to learn the drums and they never heard a sound? Okay. And that's the state of martial arts that I see it now. I'm sorry. That's, that's it. I mean, that, that's my gripe. Or for example, you want to learn tap dance and you don't hear a rhythm, right? The tap dance shoes give you feedback. And sometimes people will be like, oh yeah, it's very, it's footwork, but no tap dance is about how you use the body. The, the, the foot and the quality of your sound is, 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 is made because of what you're, you're using in your body to then control, you know, your feet. That's the end result, but it's actually coming from the center of the body. And it's how you're using weight shifts, how you're playing with rhythm. And then ultimately, ultimately, and this is my other thing, ultimately, you want to be able to improvise. And this is the other thing that I feel is quite missing from martial arts training. And I I implore people to go out there and do this is like, if you learn or you teach your students three basics, what's the riff? How are they going to improvise off of it? You know, for example, um, you know, uh, there, 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 there are people who, um, learn piano and they're like, yeah, with three notes, you can play a song. So if that's true and you can take three notes and ba, 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 da, 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 you know, whatever. Uh, I have a terrible singing voice, so excuse that. But, uh, what I'm saying is you don't need such a, a huge battery of moves to be able to test it out and play with it. And I don't see that. In a lot of martial arts, in most martial arts, because you either have the forms practitioners or you have the, the Sanda guys or the sparring people. And then, and then there's this huge riff in the middle. Like one has nothing to do with the other. And this makes me want to cry, you know? And th- this is something that Tongbei has because when I started with the Tongbei, uh, everything was functional. The forms and the weapons. And the, the weapons and the empty hand forms and also all the basics, every basic that you learned in training. And we're not talking about jumping jacks or push-ups. We're talking about basics, meaning like dan so, chuen so, um, uh, you know, you'd have, uh, rou jian, sun bei, uh, you have, uh, pi uh, you know, all these, all these sort of basic skills that you have, uh, added up to your technique. And everything had very specific applications. And so my my thing is now it's like for people, and it's not just like in Chinese martial arts or Kung Fu, but even in karate styles, you know, in 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 in, in, in other styles, it's like what what are what are they actually doing, you know, when they're doing katas, right? Because in Asian styles we have the forms, we have taolu, right? And and in the Japanese styles you have the katas. Uh what are they actually doing with it? Can they fight with it? Can they show me that on a column, right? Can you go do that on a tree and show me how the kata is so effective or why you need such a wide stance, you know, in order to do that? Um, or why we need to do two flips in the air or have your head so high, you know, your, your leg kicking so high. Is this an effective punch, you know? Um, I mean, I would like that, you know, we, we, we generate a little bit more of this conversation. So there's not such a huge rift between the forms and the actual applications anymore, because I feel like it's it's become this huge abyss in the martial arts world. And, and I would like to work on, you know, making that not be a huge abyss. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, yes. Or, for, 
Or for example, I will take, uh, you know, what I was showing you asked me what I did today in class, right? Yes. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I won't talk about the tombe and the mantis stuff. I'll, I'll talk specifically about the florettis. Okay. Uh, and this is, this is like, the sword yeah, technique, people right? I know it as, the sword, the sword you technique. know, uh, spinning, basically like spinning because you go onto YouTube or anything and it's the one thing, it's the one thing for martial arts. Every kid all over the world wants to know, Oh, I want to learn how to do that cool move. It's like, you know, when, when Daffy Duck is, is fighting and then he goes, he, he's spinning or, or maybe it's not. It's, it's the, the pig that's doing the spinning and, and then Daffy Duck gets caught in his staff, but it's, it's basically twirling your, or your staff or your sword as fast as possible. Right. So if you're doing that, how many people who are spending all this time, uh, you know, training perfect spins, you know, and we would spend hours, hours every wushu training. Go practice your spins, you know, go train it against the wall, make your spins faster, you know, better, better. But in 10 years, who taught me what the spins were for? Mm. 10 years, nobody. Not once did they ever say, and now anti, we're talking 10, go to 20 years. Not once did anyone say, what is this spin for? No, they would talk about the technical things. Oh, yes, make your wrist loose. Yeah, this is Xiaopi. It's like a stabi. This relies on the wrist. This relies on on uh, the, the, the whole use of the forearm. You know, they talk about the technicalities of how to make the spin look prettier. But nobody talked about what we were doing with the spin. And if you look at any spin, any combination, you'll see if you break it apart, it is a series of strikes and parries, Right. Like break it apart. You go take a, a, a Florida and take, take, you know, like a padded stick and go hit it against, you know, a pole or something and, and take your, your, your flower movement and do it on that. And then you'll be like, whoa, oh, that is what it is. Or for example, you know, I was really worried because, you know, I'm, I'm really into like hitting targets now. Some people have given me really <laughs> grief. Oh, why are you hitting trees? Please don't hit the trees or the leaves anymore. But I train in the forest. I'm sorry, I'm poor. So <laughs> like, we don't have a gym. So I go do that. Sometimes I did find like, a, so I won't like hurt people's feeling. I do train on like this abandoned like street pole. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so I'm not harming any trees. And I only use on the trees just to make everybody, you know, I, 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 I don't <laughs> hurt the trees. I actually use padded sticks on the trees. So I'm not not harming and then i only use the ones with sturdy barks i don't hit any pine trees or i never like cut bark off so well that's how I the tree gets its bark. internal training rosa that's how the tree <laughs> that's how the tree gets its its biofeedback yeah that's your partner you can do the same thing to me and I'm, I'm 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 okay with it you know um but anyway the thing is is uh if you take the the moves and you go practice it on a target you'll understand where is the action? What's the reaction? And it's going to completely change everything. And, oh, this was the story I was going to tell you. Like, for example, I took a bunch of Kali drills because I was telling you my background in martial arts. And Kali was uh, along with, uh, like, the Aikido. They were my first styles of, of martial arts. And so I was always doing stick fighting stuff, right? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to tombeify the Kali because I found like the Kali used a lot of like forearms. You know, they didn't use a lot of the large broad swingings and they didn't really turn the body. It was a lot of forearm movement or just isolated arm moves, you know? And so I was like, well, I'm just going to practice it on the tree because I was always practicing on a tree. I'm going to tombeify it. So it's going to really go through the whole body. I'm going to use the arm swing methods and I'm going to redo all the, all the Kali drills. Um, uh, the basic collies using that on a tree. And then, and then people started looking at that and that on social media got huge response. And I thought, Oh gosh, here comes all the hate from the collie screaming community. Bring it on. Cause they're going to be like, Oh my God, what's she doing using these long strikes? This is not collie, right? I didn't get one hate message, not one. You know why? Wow. Because, because obviously I changed the form up to look more or, or to function more like Tombe, which was what was logical to me. But what was interesting was like, they saw me hitting the sticks on a tree. And if you look at, even you go to YouTube right now, how many of the Kali videos that you see are they actually striking targets? Everyone is practicing in the air. I'm like, holy crap, you know? Even the Kali guys, that's why they were, they kept on bookmarking my videos. I'm like, why are these Kali guys, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not a, I'm not an expert at Kali. It was my first martial art, but I didn't spend like 10 years doing it. Okay. I spent like a year doing it and then I went on to other martial arts, but I understand the basics, you know, and, and they were bookmarking it because I was hitting a target. And one guy made a comment and I was like, Oh, Oh, I didn't understand. And his comment was this. He said, Oh, it has a rhythm. I was like, yes, yes. People were learning Kali and they didn't know that there was a rhythm. They were, they were hitting air drums. You know what I mean? I gave them a drum to hit. That was like a target. You could train on a bag or whatever in your gym. Take the sticks and go listen to the rhythm. Da 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 da. First you do one, two, one, two. But what you find is most fighting rhythms are not evenly metered. Most fighting rhythms, now this was something very particular to the Tongbei too. I love, love. Everything is syncopated. Friggin' everything. But you think about most strikings. It's not, huh, huh. They go, hmm, hmm. Da, 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 da. You know, there's always uh, a power strike, you know? And so when I would demonstrate various Kali techniques on the tree, they'd be like, oh, that's cool. That's a, ri- that's a cool rhythm too. You know, they didn't understand that you'd have like, this is a Sinawali. This is what a Sinawali sounds like. And they're like, oh, Sinawali has a sound, you know, unless they were working with the partner, which was different, of course, then you have someone that you're going kak, 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 kak with, but they didn't do solo training and hear a rhythm. And so they couldn't improve the quality of the martial arts that they had solo wise because they were just practicing in the air. And this is, would be such an easy fix. Everybody go find a punching bag, go find a tree or a street pole that's not connected to electricity. Go practice, right? Feedback. I, li- I like what you're doing because not only do I like what you're doing just visually, but like you're talking about, there's a kinesthetic, but also a whole body awareness. It just, it, it just, it seems like you've got it tactilely. It seems like you've got the visual aid, but you've also got the auditory response. And I don't know a lot of people that are doing that with their training. So I think that's really cool, Rosa. Yeah, the yeah, sound it's... stuff that was like, remember I told you, Zhang Lao Si, day one <laughs> in Beijing, <laughs> when I'm standing in the dark, I was like, he doesn't want to see us. He goes, I don't need to see you. I can hear you. <laughs> I was like, what, what, what? And it's true. It's absolutely true. 